Hey everyone, it's time for another quick batch of Big Green Game Reviews based on movies and TV shows. And today I figured, let's go a little G-rated and look at some games based on kids' movies and TV shows at the time. As there were quite a few. Are any of them good? Well, you know, mileage may vary, that sort of thing. I have no idea. It's, it's all going to be new to me. Well, some of them. But, you know what, let's not waste any more time and get right into it with our first game. A game that makes you ponder the question, did Ants the movie need a game, let alone a kart racing game? I'm of course talking about Ants Extreme Racing. For those who may not know what the hell Ants is, it's a 1998 CG kids film from DreamWorks that came out around the same time as the Disney Pixar classic A Bug's Life, which both films shared similar traits leading to a big feud between the two companies. Truthfully, I have never seen Ants and really have no desire to as it just never looked appealing to me. But that's fine, since the game released four years after the film was relevant and doesn't even follow the plot. Ants Extreme Racing has you choose one of the main insects and complete a series of race challenges that have you driving a cart, riding or flying a bug, riding a surfboard, or using your own feet to win first place in each race, unlocking the next challenge until you're the winner. Besides the multiplayer mode, that's pretty much it. You can unlock a few more characters, sure, but that's the gist of the game. Once you've won with all characters, there's nothing left to do. For the most part, Ants is a straight up ripoff of Mario Kart with a little bit of Diddy Kong racing thrown in. You have the standard power-ups like missiles, shields, and turbo boosts, though I find it funny that the AI opponents always seem to get the best stuff. The controls are janky, the music's forgettable, and the visuals look like a slightly polished PS1 game. That's really all I have to say on this one, again due to the fact that it's an incredibly bare bones game. Actually, scratch that, I, I do have one thing to say, a question really. Who was this game made for? By 2002, Ants had already come and gone to the DVD shelves, so I doubt anyone said, man. I'd really love a kart racer based on a CG kids movie starring Woody Allen and Sylvester Stallone, which, by the way, aren't in this game. In fact, there's no voiceover at all. Eh, this was an odd tie-in and really should be ignored as you'll find more fun in other kart racer games. Alright, I know that was a really short review, but then again, it's a game based on hats, so what can you do? But it's okay. If you're curious about what our next game is going to be, well, you're in luck because it's, well, Curious George. You get it? Because Curious... Look, I had no segue. I'm sorry. Let's just talk about Curious George. Based on the 2006 film, itself based on the popular children's book series, Curious George the Game follows the plot of the film quite closely, with the story of how the curious little monkey met the man in the yellow hat, who's named... Ted? I don't know, I didn't see this one coming either. I did watch the cartoon back when I was a kid, so him having a name is kind of new to me. As George, you'll play through 13 levels platforming and playing mini-games to progress through the story, with your standard collectibles that unlock bonus stuff like costumes and art. You can tell that this one's a bit on the easy side, because for starters, there's no game over. If you fall or mess up on a minigame, you'll just start back at the previous checkpoint to try again. Also, the narrator pretty much tells you where to go and what to do, as well as the game doing all but play itself for you. Find a way out of the alley. <laughs> Climb the building and find Ted's apartment. Interact with the curious objects. The space exhibit is broken. It's missing a gear. The missing gear might be in Junior's office. Go into Junior's office and find the missing gear for the space exhibit. In other words, the gameplay is a bit boring, but for a kid, this isn't a bad entry-level platformer to get them started. Visually, the game shines with a cel-shaded look that mimics the hand-drawn animation of the film quite nicely. Well, on the characters. The stages themselves are a bit basic, but passable. For audio, just like many other movie tie-in games, there's clips from the film that use the voices of the actors, like Will Ferrell as Ted, However, the cast for the game sounds pretty close. A lot of other great things to see here at the museum. Have you met Og and Grog? Were Og and Grog your guides when you found the idol? No. Og and Grog are cavemen. Did the cavemen worship the idol? I, um, no. Well, maybe. Can we see the idol? Yes, can we get a little glimpse of it? We're still working out some 
small problems. But when it's ready, I can certainly promise you'll have a little glimpse. Curious George is a game I can only recommend to those gamer parents who are ready to herald their kids into the world of video games, as it's a pretty short experience, but a fun one to scratch their curiosities. The next game coming up is based on a beloved children's book by Dr. Seuss. Unfortunately, this game is based on the movie adaptation that sucked a big rubbery one when it came out in theaters. I'm, of course, talking about The Cat in the Hat. But, I mean, come on. The game's gotta be better than the movie, right? I mean, right? Again, like the other two games covered, I didn't see the movie and refused to do so because it looks like an abomination. However, the plot of the game is... Well, I'll just let the Mike Myers sound alike tell you what's up. Okay, here's the story. It was a windy, rainy day. Then, to everyone's surprise, I turn up and cheer up some kids. But then, what do you know? My magical crate is opened, the lock stolen. Magic leaks out and the whole world is in danger. Thus I, the most stylish cat ever to be seen in a hat, you know it. Have to recapture all the loose magic which has transformed the house and recover the lock from Mr. Quinn, the nasty next door neighbor who's also collecting the magic in order to make himself immensely powerful. Hey, what's this him being immensely powerful? That wasn't in my script. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, so the script's changed. Mm, mm-hmm. And, and what exactly were you planning on telling me? You know, <laughs> you know, the star of this little adventure? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, whatever. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the ride is almost over. Thank you for flying Cat in the Hat Airlines, and please get ready to press the start button so we can get this whole mess tidied up. Okay, now that that's out of the way, on to the actual game. Cat in the Hat is your typical 2D platformer where you go through each stage chasing after Quinn while grabbing collectibles like magic points that help unlock the next stage and keys to open the stage's bonus level that houses a gem to collect, with a bonus stage unlocked when you collect all gems. There's also clapboards that unlock movie clips, but there's no need to collect those unless you want to see clips from that movie. In fact, the best game to compare Cat the Hat to is the PS1 classic Klonoa. Like that game, the cat uses an attack, in this case his umbrella, to capture enemies and use them as a sort of ammo to shoot at other enemies or objects. He can also glide, ground slam, and defend with the umbrella as well. Just like Klonoa, the controls are actually quite good here, which surprised the hell out of me. In fact, the gameplay overall surprised me as it's not bad, considering the source material. Now, don't get me wrong, this isn't a masterpiece or anything, but it's not as bad as the old reviews make it out to be. For the visuals, the world you explore may not be technically impressive, but they are creative, with twisted versions of standard household items like a TV, furnace, houseplant, washer and dryer, and more. As for characters, the enemies are also quite creative and odd-looking, while the humans and the cat look somewhat like their film counterparts, especially Alec Baldwin as Quinn. Granted, none of the film's actors reprise their roles here, but the actors replacing them are decent, with the cat's VO pulling off a pretty good annoying cat in the hat. It wasn't going to take much for the game version of the film that was so bad that Dr. Seuss's widow barred any more live-action adaptations of his work to be made, but it does, resulting in a pretty basic but fun 2D platformer. If you're a fan of the Klonoa games, you might enjoy giving this one a go. Even if this game isn't your cup of tea, please don't watch the movie if you haven't yet. Your soul will thank you. As you can see, there's been a bit of a pattern where I'm talking about games based on movies I have never even seen or don't want to see personally. But thankfully, this next one is not only based on a movie I have seen, but actually like, and that's The Incredibles. So how does the game version of The Incredibles stack up to the movie? Based on the hit Disney Pixar film, the story of the game follows its source material pretty closely, with you taking control of the titular family as they try to stop the evil Syndrome from unleashing his master plan. Throughout the game, you're given the opportunity to play as Mr. Incredible, whose stages are all about using his strength, his wife Elastigirl, who can stretch her body into different shapes, daughter Violet, whose invisibility and barriers are used for stealth, and son Dash, who's all about super speed. 
For the most part, The Incredibles is your standard platformer based on an animated film. You go from stage to stage, beating up enemies, avoiding obstacles, and solve a puzzle or two. What does break up the monotony a little is that each member, for the most part, does play differently. While Bob and Helen are about the same, with the exception of their powers, Violet is all about sneaking around enemies and reaching the goal without being seen, with a one-hit kill as your penalty. Dash's levels, on the other hand, are more like checkpoint races where you have to reach the goals in the allotted time. There's even a stage where he plays Dash and Violet together, rolling around in a shield ball, kind of reminiscent of that one section in Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex. Of course, being a tie-in game from the mid-2000s, there's collectibles you get that unlock bonus stills and videos from the movie, otherwise known as stuff you see on a DVD bonus disc. Truthfully, there's not much wrong with this one. There are a few sections that can be a little cheap, causing you to start over a few times, looking at you, Dash, Plus, the controls can be a little unresponsive here and there, but other than that, it's a basic game that you can breeze through in a weekend, if you have the patience. Visually, the game does a great job of capturing the look of the movie. Granted, I've always felt that Pixar characters were easy to recreate in a video game due to them also being computer generated. As for the levels themselves, they're also faithful to the material, from the city, the burning building Bob and Frozone enter to rescue civilians, to Syndrome's Island. For audio, the music is just as good as the film's soundtrack, mainly due to it also being composed by the same composer, Michael Giacano. Voice acting goes the same route as the last Disney Pixar game I covered, Finding Nemo, where the main cast is heard in the cutscenes and the game is done by different actors. However, with the case of The Incredibles, the film's cast reprise their roles here, with the exception of Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl, originally voiced by Craig T. Nelson and Holly Hunter respectively. Thankfully, the actors chosen here do a respectable job. There's not much else to say about The Incredibles. It's another tie-in game that, while not amazing, isn't that bad either. Despite its few problems, it can be enjoyable to play with your kids on a rainy weekend or if you're just bored. If you see it for cheap out in the wild, give it a go if you're a fan of the film or platformers in general. Now, this wouldn't be the only time this superhero family would appear on the big green, as a sequel did show up later. It's no longer canon, but we'll save that story for another time. So there you have it. There's four games based on kids' movies, and the quality has kind of been hit or miss. I mean, if anything, I was really surprised with Cat in the Hat. I was not expecting a Klonoa clone, of all things. But we're not done yet, as we're now going to talk about four different games based on kids' shows at the time. And full disclosure... I haven't really watched these shows, I'm mostly talking about them as Xbox games, so be gentle in the comments, you know, if there's something like, oh wow, you didn't talk about this or that, or I looked at it as a video game and nothing more. I knew a little bit about the show, but that's it. So with that in mind, we're going to start off with a <laughs> pretty well-known classic in animation these days, Nickelodeon's Avatar The Last Airbender. So. How good is the first video game adaptation of this classic animated story? Set between books one and two of the show, the story of the game has Ong and his friends set out on a journey to stop the Fire Nation from warring against the other nations of the Earth. Along the way, they discover mechanical creations that are attacking the nations as well. Thus, it's up to the last airbender and his friends to figure out the mystery of these machines before it's too late. I have to admit, as someone who's never even watched the show, this game's story wasn't bad at all. Yeah, what I described wasn't very filling, but it really wasn't. What did it for me was the interactions between Ong, or is it Ang, his companions, and the different people they come across on their journey. It's not all serious, there's plenty of laughs to be had, which is quite refreshing. What's also refreshing is the gameplay, as Avatar, it turns out, is a Diablo clone, something I was not expecting at all. You progress through each stage, completing main and side quests to gain experience to level up your party, learning new bending attacks. Plus, there's armor and accessories that you can equip to boost your stats and shops to buy and sell such items, as well as craft new items with the materials you pick up. You're able to swap between the four characters on the fly with the press of the D-pad, each having their own strengths and abilities to aid the others in combat. There's also a few extra mechanics in the game to spice things up. For starters, some quests have you utilize Aang's little friend Momo to search for items, as well as use your bending abilities to uncover hidden chests in a QTE-style moment. There's even a domino-style minigame you can play to win money and equipment. 
Truthfully, this game plays fine, which, again, surprised me big time. The controls are perfectly functional, though a little more camera control would have been nice, and there's plenty of save points, so backtracking isn't too terrible. Overall, not a bad playing game. Again, what also surprised me is how good the game looks for the big green. Characters translated very well from 2D to 3D with the cell shading on display. Plus, they animate better than I thought they would. As for the stages, they're not bad and represent the locations from the show quite nicely. For music, while I'm not sure if it's the show's soundtrack, what I did hear was very energetic and flowed well into the action on screen. Meanwhile, the cast of the show reprised their roles for the game and do a fantastic job. Sorry to keep you waiting. Invasions can be so time-consuming. Uh, do you have the paste? Yes. Good. I'm going to need some help with this. Here. <laughs> ah, that's better. My lips were so chapped. Did we just spend all that time fetching you lip balm? They were chapped. I was expecting a generic beat-em-up or a bland platformer when I booted up Avatar The Last Airbender and instead got a not bad action RPG that was a fun afternoon killer. Fans of the show more than likely have played it already, but if you're curious about the world of The Last Airbender and or looking for a fun Diablo clone, this one's worth picking up. Sabotage is not that bad. I mean, it's definitely better than the live-action movie that came out, and I unfortunately had to see that one. But you know what? Let's keep the Nickelodeon motif going with our next game. Fairly Odd Parents Breaking the Rules. In Breaking the Rules, Timmy Turner's parents have gone on vacation, leaving him under the watch of his evil babysitter, Vicky. Timmy tries to make a wish, but his fairy godparents, Cosmo and Wanda, tell him it's against the rules. Mad about this, Timmy wishes that he didn't have to follow the rules, which causes the book to explode and end up in Vicky's hands, with any wish she makes coming true. Summoned to fairy court, the three are given 49 and a half hours, don't know why that much amount of time, to get the book back together before Vicky's wishes wreak too much havoc. As far as plots based on kids' shows go, it's pretty faithful to the source material. Having Timmy explore different areas due to Vicky's wishes is a neat idea and allows for some creative gameplay. Sadly though, that's not the case. Rules is a standard platformer where you play through each stage to get to the end, collecting wish stars that give you stage-specific abilities to help you out. Along with said stars, there are crowns that give you a 1-up if you collect 100, and crimson chin cards that unlock bonus videos to watch. For the most part, the main part of the gameplay is running, jumping, and taking out baddies, but there's a minigame here and there to mix up the formula. Unfortunately, it just still boils down to collecting 5 stars to gain an ability, run through the next section to collect 5 more stars, and repeat until you get to the boss and the stage is done. Now, this isn't particularly difficult to do, being a game made for kids, but with slippery controls and a camera that loves to fight with you, it doesn't help matters much. At the end of the day, though, Break Into Rules is just a very bland and boring platformer that ends up feeling more like a chore to play, and considering the source material, that shouldn't have been the case. From a visual standpoint, Rules does an alright job bringing the cartoon to life, though you can tell there are some cut corners, such as facial animation, which looks like an old Flash video from the olden days of the internet. At least the stages look somewhat unique, especially when Timmy shrunk down into the bathtub and has to traverse a toxic environment. Audio-wise, the music's not much to write about, it's passable. While the voice cast of the show reprise their roles for the game, and they do an okay job, but someone did a horrible job of mixing the audio because the voices sound horribly compressed. No! Okay, Twerp, here's how it's gonna be. I'm in charge and you're nothing. Got it! I wish Vicky didn't have that book! Well, I wish you were still in bed asleep so I wouldn't have to deal with you and your freaky, disgusting habits. We're in trouble! Now we're in trouble in Timmy's dreams! Now we're spinning around in trouble in Timmy's dreams! Whee! For being the first console game based on the show, it's a little forgivable for breaking the rules to be rough around the edges in some parts. 
but even if this game was incredibly polished, it doesn't make up for the fact that it's just boring to play, especially when there's way better kids tie-in games on the big green. It's better to just wish playing one of those instead. Okay, so Fairly Odd Parents wasn't that great of a platformer on the big green, but let's grab our remotes and switch the channel over to Kids WB with our next entry we're going to be talking about, Shaolin Showdown. Being a show that went completely under my radar, mostly due to being in college by that point, Shaolin Showdown follows the story of four young warriors who must work together to protect ancient artifacts called the Shen Gong Wu from the forces of evil. So of course with a plot like that, it stands to reason that a game would come from such an animated production and Konami delivers. With a fighting game. Yeah, I was surprised that Shaolin Showdown is a fighter as opposed to a beat-em-up, but here we are. Even more so, it's an arena-style fighter in the vein of Power Stone or Smash Brothers. Uh, sort of. There are two modes to play here. Adventure has you pick one of the four heroes and play through over 20 stages, where the goal is to fight a few enemies, collect the pieces of a scroll, fight a mini-boss, then grab a Shen Gong Wu, which initiates a showdown, or in this game's case, a minigame, where you compete against the other players or AI in order to win said artifact. After a few stages, you'll go up against the boss, which you take down with the power of teamwork or something like that. Then there's showdown mode, where you just play the mini games you've unlocked. To assist you are said Shen Gong Wu, which gives you special powers that require Qi to use. These range from range attacks to player buffs and more. Basically like the power-ups in Power Stone or Smash, but you equip them and can use them without fear of losing them. Well, unless you wager one in a showdown and lose it that way. However, you can buy them before a stage with the coins that you collect. This is all good on paper, but the execution here is a bit on the sloppy side, at least in some parts. Controls are fine, though the lock-on is terrible, always wanting to target a teammate instead of the enemy. Granted, this is one of those co-op slash competitive games, but still it'd be nice to not always go for one of the other players. Speaking of players, the AI is kinda all over the place. They love to grab all the power-ups, yet sometimes not attack any other enemies. Other times, they'll do all the work for you. On top of that, doing the same thing over and over in adventure mode gets old really fast, and since your reward is unlocking two extra characters and the mini-games in showdown mode, the hassle quickly becomes not worth it. At least with the presentation, they were able to nail the look of the show and bring it to the third dimension. The characters all pop out and make a nice transition from cartoon to game. The levels, on the other hand, are pretty basic, but fit the cartoon look very well. Meanwhile, with audio, the voice cast from the show reprise their roles, but they mostly just say the attacks they're performing, or acting like a tutorial, or in the case of the villains, chewing the scenery. So basically what you'd expect in a licensed kids show tie-in game. I can't lie, even though I've never watched Shaolin Showdown, it deserved a better game than this. Boring gameplay and a small incentive to play it just makes for a forgettable title and a sea of cash-ins. If it had been a beat-em-up, I feel that it would have had a bit more staying power, but as it is, it's best to let this one rest in peace. Okay, we got one last game to talk about today, so let's switch back to Cartoon Network with a show that I think had a popular fan base. I'm not entirely sure. Either way, it's codename Kids Next Door Operation Video Game. What a mouthful. So from what I gathered about this show, KND, as it's sometimes called, revolves around a team of 10-year-old kid spies who fight crimes that are committed against kids that are carried out by adults, using a hefty arsenal of gadgets and tech, like a certain 00 agent. The show was a big hit, lasting from 2002 to 2008, yet there were only two games for it, Operation Soda for the Game Boy Advance in 2004, and this one, Operation Video Game. The story here is... Well, there's not much of one. One afternoon, the KND are playing video games when they discover that the greatest foes they've faced have escaped the Arctic-based prison, and the team must recapture them before they can wreak havoc on kids once again. That's pretty much it. I guess in a way it does fit in like an episode of the show, but it feels a bit lazy as opposed to how the Futurama game is handled. Then again, they had the show's writers on that game. On to gameplay, KND is by all respects an action platformer. In fact, it plays very similar to another high-voltage developed title, Family Guy, where you control the numerical team through a series of levels, each having somewhat similar playstyles, but just different enough to give them their own identity. Number one is all about running and gunning. Number two sticks to shoot-em-up style stages in the cool bus. 
Number three is melee oriented. Number four is more about collecting animals with some ranged defense. And number five also gets into scrapes with her fists and feet, with each having their own super move that needs a power bar to use, which can be refilled with snacks. It's actually quite refreshing to have such variety in between stages, even if number five has a level that tries to pull a Metal Gear Solid and ends up being that level. You know what I'm talking about, the one stage in a game that's just 100% BS and really doesn't belong. Along the way, there's plenty of collectibles to grab, like rainbow monkeys to unlock bonus material, candy for health, and upgrade parts to unlock more gadgets and weapons for the kids. What surprised me the most is how well the game controls. Most games like this tend to have controls that are more awkward due to having multiple characters to play, but KND keeps it incredibly simple with a jump, attack, lock on, and action button. Of course, camera control isn't perfect, which it hardly was in games like this at the time, but it's not towel throwing bad. Visually, capturing the look of the show was handled quite nicely, with all characters making a somewhat smooth transition to 3D. And the stages, while a few of them are pulling double duty by being reused a few times, are colorful and fit pretty well. For audio, the music was a bit on the stunning side for me. Not that it's bad, in fact, it's actually quite good being a mixture of orchestral and action film style tunes. It's just something I wasn't expecting in a game where some of the villains you face are a guy who wants to clog toilets and a vampire that loves to spank kids. Yeah, not sure about that one these days. As to be expected, the voice cast from the show lend their talents to the game and they do a great job, even if their lines tend to get repeated a lot. But I, I really, really need to use the bathroom, but- Well, you don't need my permission, number four. I know! It's just that all the toilets are clogged with- Ah, oh, gross, number four. What did I tell you about trying to keep it in the bowl? No, no, you don't understand. I haven't even gone yet. But there's this globy green stuff all over the treehouse. In fact, it looks like someone blew their nose all over your bed, number one. Hmm, snot everywhere. Sounds to me like the uncommonly gross work of the common cold. Break out the vitamin C weapons and wait for backup, number four. Attention, kids next door! This is a super double code Blurbleberry. The treehouse is under attack! Copy that! Number five is on the way! All right, Stubham, lunch time's over. You're coming with me. Operation Video Game is one of the better kids licensed games I've played here on the channel, even if the bar isn't that high. The different characters and fun gameplay will keep players entertained for an afternoon, even if you've never watched the show. Will it make you a fan of Kids Next Door? Eh, probably not but at least it's something that you and your young ones can have a good time with. And with that, we've now talked about eight different licensed games based on kids' shows and movies, and with the TV shows, just like the movies, the games are kind of hit and miss. There were some good ones, like Avatar, and Kids Next Door wasn't too bad, but then you had some kind of meh ones like The Fairly Odd Parents and especially Shaolin Showdown. Then again, that's kind of the nature of these things with tie-ins. They're either going to be not so bad or just horrendous. Thankfully, or unthankfully, depending on how you look at it, we've got plenty more of these games to go. So we'll just see what happens with the next batch. But until then, this is the Dolly Popka. And as always, stay green, my friends. I'll see you next time. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode and want more of me and the Big Green, then click that subscribe button and the bell to get notified when new content arrives. I want to say a special thank you to my patrons for helping not just the channel grow, but me as a creator. You have my forever thanks. If you're interested in the channel and would like to help it grow further, consider becoming a patron today. For the cost of a soda or an item on the dollar menu, you can help myself and the channel provide the best source of big green programming and more. Once again, all the thanks and love.